My name is Jonika Smeet and I'm here to warn you about the dangers of ice cream. You may not know this, but ice cream is really dangerous and it causes drownings. And to prove this I bring you this graph that clearly shows that ice cream is very dangerous. So in this graph on the one axis I plotted the number of ice creams that are sold on any given day. And then on the other axis there are the number of drownings on such a day. You can see very clearly that there is an upgoing trend. The more ice cream there is sold, the more people drown. And I think it's safe to conclude now that ice cream should be forbidden because it makes people drown. Well, I guess you all see that this is a ridiculous example. And that what's happening here is that there's something else lying underneath. It is not the ice cream that is making people drown, it is something else. So, what is happening here? is that when people, uh, of course what's lying underneath all this is the underlying variable, the weather. So if the weather is nice and warm, people will buy more ice cream. And at the same time if the weather is nice and warm, people will go swimming more often. And uh, well, if people go swimming more often, they will also drown more often. So there's something else that's causing more drownings and also causing more ice cream. And that is the warm weather. Well, and this is an example of uh, confusion between correlation and causality. And I want to talk about this during the next few minutes and make sure that you never make mistakes like this uh, anymore. And, um, well, let's start. Uh, so the two terms I used are correlation and causality. Correlation means that you have two things happening, some event A and some event B. And you notice that there is a relation between them, so they happen at the same time, or always, if the one thing happens, the other thing never happens. There is something going on between these two, so there is a correlation. And then causality, that means that A causes B. You know, we draw a big arrow between them, one thing causes another. So if I drop a ball, well, this will cause the ball to fall on the ground. That's clear causality. And, uh, well... What many people think, if you see a correlation, they think that there must be a causality. And, um, well, this can be wrong in many ways, and I will show you some of the things that can go wrong with them. This talk will mainly be a long list of examples, and, well, let's see if you can see what's wrong with every example. The first one is uh, uh, the conclusion from uh, statistics that married men live longer. This is actually true, so if you look at the statistics and you look at married men, they have a much higher life expectancy than uh, single men. And, uh, well, this pops up in newspapers uh, once every few years, and it states that, well, marriage makes sure that men live longer. I mean, they say that marrying causes the man to live longer. Um, I recently told this to a married friend, not the guy pictured here, and uh, he said that a marriage, a married men, um, well, that their life mainly seems to be longer, that it's not really longer, it just seems that way. He didn't seem very happy about his wife. Um, what's happening here is that there is a causality, but the uh, conclusion is in the wrong direction. So what is... Uh, True is that men who have a higher life expectancy have a much higher probability of getting married. So it's not the marriage itself that's causing a higher life expectancy, it's the other way around. So men that are healthy, uh, have a better education, uh, make more money, they are much more likely to get married than men who are, well, not doing so well in life. And this is what's causing uh, the data you see that married men live longer. And if you look at men from a similar background, with a similar education, similar income whatsoever, there is absolutely no difference anymore between the married men and the single men. So there is a causality in this case, but you have to be careful which causes which. And uh, this is a rather innocent example, I think. It's not that all men will now marry just because they heard the statistic, but um, things can get more serious if you have the causality in the wrong direction. And that's my next example. Here you see me studying my ass off when I was in high school. And uh, a rather famous uh, report in the, I think it was the 80s, showed that uh, kids who have a high self-esteem do much better in high school, so they get higher grades and do better on exams. 
and um, this caused uh, psychologists to um, well see giving kids a good high self-esteem as an important goal. So for many years parents were told to make sure that their kids would have high self-esteem and then of course they would do better in schools. And then um, quite some years later people did a second study and then they looked at the direction of the causality and how they did this I think it's really smart. They looked at uh, kids who were in fourth grade and they looked at their uh, self-esteem and at their grades and then they studied these same kids two years later when they were in sixth grade and they looked at how they were doing then both on self-esteem and grades. And what was happening that high self-esteem uh, in the fourth grade didn't predict high grades in the sixth grade. So it wasn't that kids with high self-esteem would go on getting better grades later on. But the other way around, it was true. So kids who had high cell, uh, were getting high grades in the fourth grade, they were actually having much higher self-esteem by the time they were in sixth grade. And so also here the causality was in the wrong direction. So it's not high self-esteem that causes high grades. It's getting good grades that pumps up your self-esteem. So parents should be more focused on making sure their kids have a way to achieve something. doesn't have to be high grades, can also be sports or something else. But it's not that high self-esteem makes sure that you achieve in other things, it's achieving in something that makes your self-esteem go up. So you should be careful about this. And actually um, the, the results can be quite bad. So kids with high self-esteem who don't do bad, they get all kinds of problems in later life. So that's the first thing, where you see a correlation and there is a causality. But in the first, uh, uh, when they first saw it, people put the causality in the wrong direction, so the arrow had to be flipped. Then the most common uh, thing, it's the same actually as the ice creams and the drowning, the examples I'm going to give now, is that uh, sleeping with the lights on is dangerous. Well, this is really my favorite example, not just because I can show a picture of my own son, but also because this was published in Nature. The one of the best uh, magazines uh, for science uh, in the world. It's funny that I say science when I'm talking about nature. But um, Nature published this study in 1999 and uh, researchers were wondering whether sleeping with the light on was bad for toddlers. And they had this feeling that it might be somehow bad for their eyes, but they didn't know how. So they just did a big study and they uh, looked at kids who had slept with the light on uh, when they were really young, so between 0 and 2. And then they uh, looked at their chances of uh, becoming myopic, uh, short-sighted, uh, when they were older. Well, it turned out there was a really big correlation between sleeping with the light on when you were a baby and becoming short-sighted later in life. And the researchers, I have to say, they were sort of cautious. So they said, well, we've seen a correlation, we haven't proven how the causal relation might work, what is causing the eyes to go bad, but just to be on the safe side, let's advise all parents to keep the light out in the bedroom for now on. And uh, well, in the popular press, of course, this soon became Night lights are child abuse and you should never leave the lights on in your kid's room. And, um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone can guess, but there is something else lying underneath here, just like with the ice creams and the drownings where the weather was causing both. And the thing here is that uh, short-sightedness is uh, strongly inheritable. And uh, parents who are short-sighted are the same parents who uh, like to leave the light on in the bedrooms of their kids because otherwise they bump into things. So it's not the light that is causing the short-sightedness, it's the parents who cause both leaving the light on and the short-sightedness because they give the genes to their kids. So that is an example of a hidden variable. And I must say I'm very aware of these mistakes, but I sometimes uh, find myself making this uh, error in reasoning. And the recent example also about my son, um, I decided to show uh, a nice picture and not one of extreme diarrhea, but this is when I thought about this. So my son had uh, diarrhea, he was really really ill and I gave him some medicine, which were these pills you have to put in his butt. It's all, oh it's lovely, 
you, you're very happy that you don't get to see the real pictures. And I noticed at some point that every time I gave my son the medicine, that quite soon after he would poop. And I really thought like, oh, this medicine is making him poop, it's really bad medicine, why am I using this? And then I realized like, oh yeah, he has diarrhea because he's ill, and I'm giving the medicine because he's ill. And it's not the medicine that's causing the diarrhea, it's the sickness. And it, uh, it took me a while, and uh, I think this is quite usual in your daily life to make these conclusions really, really fast. This is an example uh, where you see two things happening at the same time, but where actually, uh, well, pretty much nothing is uh, happening between these two events. And I stole this example from The Simpsons. I think you should always steal examples from really good shows like The Simpsons. Uh, by the way, Simpsons has two writers who have a PhD in mathematics, so they are excellent in uh, finding these examples. And it's about a tire repelling rock. Uh, in this episode there is a bear walking around Springfield, and uh, they, the city installed a bear patrol, and Homer Simpson concludes that the bear patrol must be working wonderfully, because since it's been installed there has been no bear uh, around. And then his daughter Lisa explains that this is, you know, uh, incorrect reasoning. And she says, look, I've got a rock here and it's tiger repellent. And then her dad says, what? Does it repel tigers? What? Is it a magic rock? And she says, no, it's just a stupid rock. But I don't see any tigers, do you? And then her father wants to buy the rock. Uh, well, I think you can see that the two events, like there are no tigers and I hold a rock here, are not really related. But still, these things also tend to be uh, mixed up as having a causality. So, uh, this is a recent example I read on a blog about uh, homeopathy. I'm not a big fan of it, as you will see. Um, and it was about a small kid who hurt his knee and then was crying a lot. And then someone put some magic potion on the knee and lo and behold the kid stopped crying. I am pretty sure that even if there was nothing on the knee, the kid would have stopped crying. And even if you had just, you know, given a kiss, the kid would also have stopped crying. It's not proof that the, the herbal medicine was really working. It's proof that, well, you know, you can make a kid stop crying if he hurts his knee by doing, giving some attention. And uh, so it's, uh, that's an example. And you see it, um, what you also see happening a lot is that people have a... Uh, a very small illness that will heal from itself, so like a cold or the flu, that they will wait doing something about it because they think like, oh, okay, I'll get better, I'll get better. And at some point you're really sick of it and you think, okay, now I'll get into action. And then you read online that someone recommends that you put a spider into a peach and you eat it. This is really true. And then lo and behold, you get better. And then they conclude that it must have come from the spider and the peach. But if they had just waited and done nothing, they would also have healed. So this is also a common mix-up between correlation and causality. You have to be um, very careful when you see a correlation. So here I've drawn two graphs. One is the number of vaccines that are giving now in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And then there's the uh, number of diagnosed uh, kids with autism. And you see that these graphs seem very correlated. And there are people who say that vaccines cause autism because these graphs look so similar. And that is absolutely nonsense. Uh, you can draw graphs that look very similar, from which it's clear that there is uh, no relation whatsoever. So uh, a very common example is the, the uh, number of pirates in the world. And if you turn that graph upside down, so the number of pirates is going down, well maybe slightly going up lately with the Somalian pirates, and you put it with a global warming graph, you see a very, very similar graph. So you could say that the decrease of pirates is causing global warming. And you could make a graph of the number of kids that are named uh, Jaden, like after Britney Spears named her son Jaden, and the depth of Greece. And you would also see that these graphs are very, very similar. But of course, it doesn't say that all these boys who are called Jaden are causing the depth of Greece, I think. 
Then there is a final way to mix up correlation and causality and that is that things are causing each other in a very difficult way, in a bi-directional causality. And one example is uh, higher education and high income. Which is causing which? So is it true that people who have a high income will also get a higher education? Or is it true that kids uh, with a higher education will later get a higher income? It's very hard to separate these two and I think they can you know, they cannot be taken apart. So the main question I think is, what do you do when you find a correlation? You see that there is something going on between two data, sets of data, and you want to know, uh, can I prove a causality? Uh, what can you do? It seems sort of hopeless. And, um, well, I brought you a package of cigarettes with a clear warning um, Tobacco causes cancer. And this is now something that is, well, I think it's taken for effect that uh, smoking causes cancer, smoking kills, it's, we all see it as proven. But when, um, in the beginning there, so this was in the 60s, there were first time there was found a relation, a very strong correlation between people who smoke and people who die of lung cancer. And, uh, well, it wasn't straightforward to conclude from this that smoking causes lung cancer. And especially the tobacco companies, they are very avid in finding other reasons. So they said like, yeah, but it might be true that there is a hidden variable. So it could be that people who smoke a lot are also drinking a lot and maybe drinking causes lung cancer. Or it could be that people who smoke a lot, uh, well, they're in general not such healthy people. They don't work out, they s don't sleep enough, they are single, and uh, well, that is bad for you. So maybe it's not the smoking, it might be something else. And so what you would really like to do here is do a double-blind study where you could give two groups and you say to one group, well, you're all going to smoke for the rest of your lives. And to the other group you say, you can never touch a cigarette again. And then you have to pick the group so that they are all very similar. But of course, this will not happen in real life. You cannot do this. You cannot do this test. You cannot force people to smoke and other people force them to not smoke. And it's the same with, uh, uh, with the results I said about the children the light on. You cannot ask parents to flip the light on and others who don't, that people will not do this. So uh, you have to find tricks and luckily there are tricks, there are statistical tricks that can help you find out whether there's a hidden variable. They're very uh, sophisticated, quite new actually and uh, what you can do, um, what's easy to understand is that you have to have a lot of data. So for lung cancer at some point there was so many data that they could say well we can see that people who drink a lot um, we can compare people who drink a lot and smoke a lot with people who drink a lot and don't smoke. And we see that the people who smoke a lot really do get cancer more often. So then you've uh, taken out of account the drinking. And then you can do this for many other arguments. You can also do it more abstractly. So to find out whether there is, uh, whether there might be something else hidden you haven't even found in your data. But you have to be really careful. And my main message of today is not that, well, I think not all of you are researchers, probably only very few of you are researchers, but I think all of you sometimes come across the newspaper uh, where there's an article saying that something causes something else and that everyone is doing something. And then you have to be really careful when you read it and think, is it really true? So one of my hobbies is uh, collecting these examples. I also ask people in the audience to send them to me. So I have like a whole bunch of them now. And uh, just someone I found uh, that was so funny because they are sort of opposite. So the Daily Mail first said coffee may raise child cancer. And then the next uh, research said that four cups of cancer uh, can help prevent womb cancer. And so somehow they found some correlations between drinking coffee and cancer. But it's really hard to say that really coffee is causing cancer or predict preventing cancer. It's not something that's easy to say. So next time you see something like that, think about the ice cream. Think about the drownings and realize that it might not be 
as steady as they told you. Thank you very much.